Thank you, Tana. Thank you, praise team. We can never sing about God's goodness to us or what Jesus has done for us enough. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I want to begin by reminding you, in, in preparation for this message you're going to hear and receiving the emblems you will receive, that when Jesus died on the cross, crucifixion was extremely painful. We can hardly imagine it. And yet, the greater pain was not crucifixion, but the greater pain was him dealing with your sin and mine. But physical crucifixion, that part of it, as they hung there, it would become painful to even breathe, let alone speak. We have recorded in Scripture seven sayings or words from the cross. Jesus may have said more, but I rather doubt it. And today we are going to focus on one of those sayings that was said on the cross. In fact, we're going to focus on one that is just one word in the original. But before we do, I want you to listen intently to all seven sayings that Jesus gave from the cross and the context in which they were given. So please listen carefully as you hear the seven sayings of Jesus. And they struck him on the head with a reed stick, spit on him, and dropped to their knees in mock worship. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. While they were nailing Jesus to the cross, he prayed over and over. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Then this criminal said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, Listen, what I say today is true. You will be with me in paradise. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. And he said to this disciple, Here is your mother. And from then on, this disciple took her into his home. From noon until three in the afternoon darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. When Jesus tasted the vinegar, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and died. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, I give you my life. After Jesus said this, he died. Have you ever been thirsty? I'm not talking about thirsty. I'm talking about thirsty. Have you ever been so thirsty that's all you could think about? When I was younger, somewhat, in 2008, I went on a backpacking trip in Yosemite with my son and his friend. And we were backpacking from White Wolf, Lone Wolf Campground, White Wolf Campground to Tuolumne Meadows. And that goes through the Grand Canyon of the Tuolumne. 
and it was called the Grand Canyon of the Tuolumne because it's just as dry and dusty without shade as the Grand Canyon itself. And it was in 2008, there was a drought going on, and we camped at White Wolf Campground, and then in the morning we took off early, filling our bottles of water, I had two of them, 32 ounces each, and then taking off. We got to um, the Grand Canyon of Tuolumne, the trail led down in there, and as we started down, the sun was already beating down on us. And my son and his friend, the two young bucks, said, we're not waiting for you, we'll, we'll see you later, and they took off, because not only was I much older than them and didn't have the vim and vigor they did, but uh, I couldn't wear my hearing aids so I could listen for rattlesnakes because I would be sweating and it would get, get wet. And so I had to be a little slower in how I walked to make sure I wasn't meeting any friends in the path if you catch my drift. And so we're walking along, and, and by 9.30 or so, I finished 32 ounces of water. And I had a map with me which showed where the streams would cross the, the path so I could get more water and filter it out, and where some ponds were. And at about 10 o'clock or so, I came to the, second, the place where there should be a stream, and all there was there was a dry gully. There was no water. And I was thirsty, so I took a drink, and I thought, well, I looked at my map. The next one's not too far away. Uh, I'll get water there. And I got to the next one, and it, there was a dry gulch without any water. I looked at my map again, and there was a, a bigger stream, so uh, I was really getting thirsty, so I took some more water. I got to that next bigger stream, and it was a bigger dry gulch, and there was no water. And I thought, surely, surely the guys are going to wait for me. They've got to be up there soon. And I was so thirsty, and I probably drank the water before I should have, and it was all gone. And about 11 o'clock or so, I'm starting to get anxious because all the water I had drunk was coming out of my pores and nowhere else. And I knew I was becoming dehydrated. And I knew if I became too dehydrated, that could spell trouble. And suddenly, all I could think about was water, water. That's all I could think about. And the more I thought about it, the thirstier I got. And I came to the last place where there was supposed to be a pond right next to the, to the path, and there was no water in the path, just a bunch of muddy, yucky stuff. And I began even to pray, Lord, send Mark back. Help me find water, whatever. I really was worried, and I was so thirsty. Well, before too long, my son comes up over a hill. His backpack is off. He's got two bottles, one for him and one for me. And he gave me the water, and I was so relieved in many ways. And we made it to where he had found water not too far away. Have you ever been so thirsty that all you could think about was water? I want to go back and read that one word, the saying of Jesus, which was the fifth saying he gave on the cross. It is one word. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. There are two details I want to bring to your attention from this. The first one, it says that the uh, sour wine was placed on a sponge on a hyssop branch. Why that detail? Because the hyssop branch was used in Scripture as a symbol of cleansing. It was used in the cleansing of leprosy to show that a person had been cleansed from leprosy. It was used as a symbol of cleansing from sin. Remember what D David prayed when he prayed his prayer for forgiveness? Cleanse me with what? Hyssop, and I shall be clean. I think it was a hyssop branch because God wanted Jesus to know that the cleansing that he would provide would be effective against the worst sin. The second detail he said that him saying, I thirst, would fulfill scripture. But what scripture? 
What scripture would it fulfill? Well, the scripture that it fulfilled is found in Psalm 69. And in Psalm 69, which is one of the most obvious messianic psalms that you will find, this is what it said, Reproaches have broken my heart, so that I am in despair. I looked for pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. For my thirst. And when Jesus said, I thirst, the Roman soldiers reached out and gave the sponge because they thought he meant, I'm thirsty, I need something to drink. And certainly he, he was that. But I think that's not all. For thirst in the Old Testament had a specific meaning. Let's look at Psalm 63, 1 to 4. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry land and weary land where there is no water. So I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. Could Jesus have had this passage of Scripture in mind when he said, I thirst. I think it's very possible. In fact, let, let's go back to what it said in John 19. After this, G Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, what was finished? His sacrifice for sin. Knowing that it all is finished, he said, I thirst. What is interesting, if you look at the psalm before Psalm 63, and if you look at the psalm after Psalm 63, there are some very important things that tie into Jesus asking and saying, I thirst. In Psalm 62, it talks about the psalmist being attacked. And I think that's looking forward to Jesus. Being attacked. False charges being made against them. The fact that he would trust God in spite of them because God was his refuge, even under these circumstances. It, afterwards, in Psalm 60, the end of Psalm 63, in Psalm 64... He talks about the fact that he would bless God as long as he lived, that he would cling to God even when he was mistreated, even when devious plot was made against him, even when he was uh, poured out disgrace upon him. And then he ends by saying, I will find my refuge in you, God. You see, I believe Jesus' physical thirst for water was secondary, a secondary fulfillment of that passage. His thirst for God was his primary fulfillment. When Jesus cried out, I thirst, it wasn't just for water, although that was true. You see, when Jesus was on the cross up until noon, the sun was beating down on him. By that time, most of the, the, the wounds in his back had, had dried up. When Jesus was crying out at the first part, that, that sun was there. His throat would have been parched and probably was the whole time. But then darkness came and Jesus cried out, what words? My God, my God, why have you forsaken or abandoned me? And it's after he says those words of abandonment that he cries out and says, I thirst. And I firmly believe the thirst to which Jesus was referring to was primarily his thirst for God when he felt forsaken by God. You see, Jesus thirsted for God all his life, his entire life. In the wilderness, there for 40 days, it says he didn't drink any water. Why? Because I think his thirst for God there was stronger than his thirst for water. When Jesus was doing his ministry, he would often go to times of solitude to be with God and to have his thirst for God replenished. When Jesus was in his ministry in the Garden of Gethsemane, it was because of his thirst for God and God's will in his life to be performed. And when Jesus was on the cross, it was his thirst for God. You see, even in his ministry, Jesus sought to create a thirst for God in others. In his teaching, he taught them that he was the water of life. In his interactions with others, with the woman at the well, he told her that if she drank from the water he would give, she would never thirst in the same way again. And then there were the miracles when he healed the blind man. He said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. You see, 
Water in the Gospel of John was a symbol of cleansing. It was a symbol of healing. It was a symbol of eternal life. So I think we need to ask the question today as we prepare to take the emblems of the Lord's Supper. We need to ask this question, to what extent do I thirst for God? To what extent do I thirst for God? Are, are you satisfied with the way you thirst for God? You see, the thirst for God begins in many ways. The thirst for God is kind of like a physical thirst. In, in trials and temptations, when, when things are getting hot and difficult, we, we thirst for God. When, when the sun's beating down on us in our lives, we thirst for God. When we overexert by trying to do it in our own power and strength, we thirst for God. When, when we're out of spiritual life, when we've not had time with God in his word or prayer, we thirst for God. You know, there, there's a text in the Old Testament that reminds us all of how we thirst for God in, in all the wrong ways. Jeremiah 2, 12 to 13, Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns, cisterns that can hold no water. What are the broken cisterns in your life? Is the broken cistern a desire to be loved and accepted? To please others and to know that they want to be with you? Is the broken cistern materialism, having enough things? Is it focusing on your accomplishments or your position and what you want from other people? Is it even thinking that because I'm a Christian, God wants me to be happy? And so I'm searching to being happy before I search for pleasing God. There is another test, text that I want you to look at this morning. It's Isaiah 55, verses 1 to 3. And I think Jesus may have had this on his mind and heart as well. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. As we consider this passage, how do we come and satisfy our thirst. It's by spending time in the word. It's by prayer. It's by abiding. It's by fellowshipping with other Christians, learning from each other, growing together. It's by worship. It's by admitting that we are sinners who need God's mercy and who need his grace to become the people he has called us to be. So I want to ask you the question, what makes you thirsty for God? How thirsty are you for God today? Do you have other thirsts that are greater than your thirst for God? In reality, whatever your thirst for other things are, that really is a sign that you are thirsting for God himself. For only God can satisfy the deepest needs and longings of our hearts. Paul said that we need to learn to be content in all things. Why? Because Paul had learned what it meant to thirst for God and to find refreshment in him. Today, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper together. And in the supper, you will drink from the cup the wine reminding us that Jesus' blood was shed for us. And as we celebrate, there will be the foot washing service. And in the foot washing service, you'll be reminded that it's because Jesus died for us that you can be cleansed from sin as well. 
and that he died for us so that we can serve others. And, and yes, even in serving others, that's a way we can satisfy our thirst for God.